Every day, we read texts, thousands of words, in books, on our cell phones, on billboards outside. Usually, we are able to process this flood of communication flawlessly. Sometimes, however, we get stuck. We cannot understand what the text means. We experience ourselves as standing outside the textual communication. The communication-oriented analysis is a method to get a grip on texts. More precisely, on the communication a text is. This is the first of three clips on this methodology. The first clip focuses on the basics. All beginners are welcome. Any prior knowledge of this methodology is not required. On the most basic level, a text is a communication between an author and a reader. Think of Homer's Iliad, Luke's Gospel, or Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. The author wishes to tell his or her readers something, the story of the Trojan horse, for example, or Jesus' birth in a manger in Bethlehem, or how to lose a ring in a volcano. And the author does so by writing down a text. The reader reads the author's text and now understands what the author wishes to communicate. Simple as that. But things become more complex rapidly. There is quite a difference between what is told in the text and the world outside that text. To give an example, if I tell or write the fairy tale of Red Riding Hood, I could do that as follows. Dear children of primary school The Rainbow, I am the great wizard Dumbledore, and I am here today in your school to tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a young girl. She disregarded her mother's instructions to not stray from the path through the wood. Therefore, she got lost and had a talk with a bear who eventually ate her. Let this be a lesson for all of you. Always obey your mother. I guess that in real life you have never seen a girl and a bear having a talk together. This makes clear that there is a difference between the characters performing in a text, on the textual stage, and the world outside the text. The fact that there is a Trojan horse in the text of the Iliad does not imply that there was a conquest of Troy by means of a large wooden horse in historical reality. The fact that there is a manger in Luke's story of the birth of Jesus does not imply that, in historical reality, infant Jesus lay in a manger. Furthermore, you probably do not feel addressed. You're presumably not a little child. But what is more, whether this story is or is not something to learn from is up to you. Maybe you are an adventurer who likes to hike off-trail in the woods without being afraid of bears. And likewise, I am not a great wizard telling fairy tales, but a university professor trying to explain a methodology to you. There is, as you will already have experienced, a difference between the real author of this fairy tale, me, and its self-identified text-imminent author, Dumbledore the Wizard. Likewise, there is a difference between the real reader of Red Riding Hood, you, and the self-identified text-imminent reader, the children of the primary school The Rainbow. There is always a difference between the real author and the text-imminent author, in this case between Wizard Dumbledore and me as a university professor, and between the real reader and the text-imminent reader, in this case the little children who have to obey their mothers and you as a university student. All texts have both a real author and text-imminent author, a real reader and a text-imminent reader, from novels to instruction manuals from poetry to university syllabi. But not all texts are kind enough to identify the text-imminent author or text-imminent reader. Usually, they are hidden in the text itself. One of the most common manifestations of the text-imminent author popping up out of the text itself is the I-narrator, who places itself on the stage as one of the characters. In a similar way, one of the most common manifestations of the text-imminent reader popping up out of the text itself is the direct vocative, a you, like in the example of Red Riding Hood. Yet one other step needs to be taken to understand the basis of the communication-oriented analysis. What is the relationship between the text-imminent author and reader with their counterparts outside the text? In other words, how is a link possible between the real and text-imminent author and between the real and text-imminent reader? For this, we need what is called the implied author and implied reader. 
The implied author and implied reader provide the necessary possibility conditions for the text. The real author and the text imminent author and reader share the same sociolinguo historical framework through which they can communicate with one another. Language, culture, social lifestyle, shared history, and so forth are stored here. This also explains why, for some real readers, a text can be so impenetrable, especially from a faraway region or from a period deep in history. For example, from the 12th century BCE, the horse became very important in warfare. Real readers from the 21st century have to make an effort to understand this. Contemporary readers of Luke's Gospel knew that all houses had a manger built into the wall. Actual real readers fantasize a stable for the manger. This concludes part one of the communication-oriented analysis. We hope to see you in part two.